Father God, for all of your goodness, we are grateful for your promises that we can stand on, that we are forgiven and adopted into your family and blessed with the Holy Spirit to equip and preserve us for the day of the Lord. Father, we lean into those promises. We stand on the rock that is your Son because he is our only hope. So bless us today. Bless us as we engage the Word, as we fellowship as believers, as we celebrate the promises of sacrament to know that nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing in all creation can remove us from this blessing. So we ask, Lord, that you'll now equip us to be hearers and doers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you to find a spot just for a moment. A nice, comfortable spot. <laughs> I didn't bring any props. I did write this in my study. No other room in the house. <laughs> I, it took a minute, but yeah, thanks for that. You know, I love that song. Uh, I bet I listened to it a dozen times in the past three days. Um, to know that a breakthrough is coming. To know that by faith, we believe in miracles, amen? It, it's part of what we hope for, uh, to be in prayer so much over these past few days for people who are part of the family of Alive, for those who are struggling, for those who have become shut in. And this morning already, I visited with three elders who are putting together a roster to go to their homes over the next two weeks and celebrate communion in their house. Uh, we used to call it second communion, it's at home communion, and they're gonna take that blessing along with some elements and the word and song and prayer, and they're gonna move into those people's houses. And one of the elders told me today, they were just, when they talk on the phone with those people to set up that schedule, uh, those families were overwhelmed with joy because it's been a year since they celebrated communion because they haven't been able to be in worship. It's an amazing thing that not only do we get to celebrate these promises and stand on them here in corporate worship, but for everyone as they journey, even those who are at home, for whatever reason, they get to stand on those same promises. And because he promised it, it's true and sure. As I was thinking about this message uh, over the past few months, um, it got rewritten a number of times, partly uh, because it's Sacrament Sunday. And I, I love sacraments, you know that. I mean, I wish we could be sacraments every Sunday, you know. Um, I don't know if I were Catholic, it'd be mass confusion, but we, uh, I'll give you a minute, you'll get it tomorrow. But when we get to do that, I'm overwhelmed. You know, I, when I was in seminary, we had to memorize the form and because uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's a songbook, and in the back of the songbook, there's forms, and we had to memorize those. And so to, to move through the promises of baptism, I just wrote F-A-S-R. His promises to us in baptism is that he promises to forgive us, to adopt us into his family, which is the church, to send us the Holy Spirit every day to renew and refresh us, and to resurrect us into eternal life. Those are the promises I stand on, and it becomes a part of my language and a part of my prayer. And now you get to teach Coven that he's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and that someday he's going to meet him. And his job is to grab hold of that faith that God installed there and to engage it, to grow up into maturity, so that when the trumpets blast, when the name of Christ is revealed and he shows up, <laughs> Coven gets to be a part of that fellowship. It's an amazing and wonderful journey that you guys are on because he is coming back, amen? Am I right? He's coming back, right? Talk to me, say yes. He is. The early church in the New Testament, they thought it would be right away, like next week, like that immediate. Some of them even just quit their jobs to hang out and wait for Jesus to return. There is scriptural evidence that they were uh, encouraged, hey, you still gotta work. While you wait, you should have a job. John received the revelation from Jesus. We know it as the book of Revelation. On the island of Patmos, he heard these words from the Lord Jesus. And behold, I am coming back soon. Even 2,000 years ago, people were waiting like it was going to be very soon. The apostle, as he became a believer, he believed that the second coming of Jesus was imminent, that it was going to happen at any time, but it was through a life of difficulty, of trial, of persecution, and imprisonment that he learned that he would first suffer for Christ and die because of his name before he would meet Jesus. 
because I'm a visual person and I love to see the stories of Scripture in three dimensions, I wonder what it was like on, uh, on the day that Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection. Remember, he went up uh, with his disciples, and then he was taken up before their very eyes. And the, and the angel said to him, what, what, what are you looking for? As you have seen him go, he will return. And I wonder, before that angel told them and gave him the commentary for understanding, did they look at each other and, and with questions in their eyes and, and in their voice? He's coming back, Right? Ever since Jesus gave us the promise that he would return, we've been waiting. And in every one of us, there's this strange mix of believing that he's coming soon and hoping that it doesn't take forever. It's this strange mix of wanting it to be today, knowing that we want to live our whole lives And then somehow on the end of that rope, it begins to fade and fray a little bit, and we wonder if he's coming back. We still wonder, don't we? How long will it be? How long will this season last? How long will this trouble last? You know, recently we've uh, kept vigil and stood with people as they were translated into glory. Some of them suffered for years with cancer. Some of them very quickly, a matter of days. But every one of them wonders in that moment, what will it be like? One of our members said, "Um, it's not dying and meeting Jesus, but I wonder what the translation will be like. What will that be like? And there's so much that we don't know. And if we're honest with each other, with ourselves this morning, we'll know that we have this strange mix in us, right? Of hope and faith and belief and of wonder of all the things that we don't know. And somehow that has to come together in our hearts. And this past year has been really hard. We've had to endure a lot of things and some of it's been really distracting. How long do we have to wear these dumb masks? How long will sickness last? How long before there's immunity in our community so that we can change our behavior? I know it's tiring. I pray for you all the time that you can be enduring. So today, as one of your pastors, I want to say hang in there because help and health and hope are on the way. No matter what it is, Waiting is hard. And the scripture teaches us clearly in a variety of places that while we wait, we can fall off the rail. We can, we can mess up. We can give up. We can even move on. But I want you to know this. There will be two sentences in, in this manuscript that you, you should remember. One of them is that God knows waiting is hard. Your father knows this is hard and it's hard even for believers because we have a hope we know the resurrection is for sure it's the rock the bedrock of our faith it's the foundation of what we believe in fact the scripture says if there is no resurrection then we're just the dumbest people on the planet we know that's true but waiting even for believers is hard believers can forget about god when they're distracted and they feel like they're not hearing from him for a while Or even when it feels like, God, do you even care? All the festivals and the rhythms and the rituals of the Old Testament were in place nearly for a single reason. And that is, it was to help us remember. It didn't matter if it was a a seasonal festival where you would bring in the harvest and, and, and bring up the sacrifices into the temple. There were pilgrimage festivals. There were ones you would do at home. There was the Passover that would help us remember. Even the standing stones where we would set up stones to remember that in this place, God met us. In this place, God allowed us to enter into his promises. All of those rituals, even baptism, helps us remember One of the cool things in the form that I had to memorize a long time ago was that it's not just for you and your family, but the reason that we do it in corporate worship is so that all of us can remember our baptism and that we can remember that the promises of God are sure for us as well. So we need to remind ourselves 
to encourage one another all the more as we see that day approaching or we will fade and we may fade so deeply that we harm the heart of our father sounds pretty dark and heavy doesn't it that you know if we're not careful that our rhythms can evaporate and we begin to harm God's heart but before we pray listen to these words from Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 it talks about the people in the days of Noah and in six chapters Genesis 6 in six chapters of creation people had forgotten about God and they no longer knew him and they grieved the heart of God listen to this and then we'll have a prayer Genesis 6 5 the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled isn't it amazing how people can fade verse 7 so the Lord said I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I've created and with them the animals the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them you see that's the condition of the human heart is we can so quickly forget the promises of God so let's start with a prayer and then we'll launch into the scriptures pray with me father I have grieved your heart because of my sin I have filled your heart with ache and yet you love me and yet you love us our righteousness is in Christ alone. He alone is our hope and salvation. So help us, Lord. Help us to wait well, to not fall off or to wander away. Help us to move forward, to follow after you, to do whatever you want me to do, to take up our cross and with all of our might run the race set before us. We need a breakthrough. We need that miracle that we just sang about. So bless us, Lord. Help us to remember your promises to us, to forgive us and adopt us, to send the Holy Spirit to us and to resurrect us. Your grace is always enough. Help us to remember that you are coming back and that you love us and you want us and you'll stop at nothing to save us. We bless and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 24. I think that screen was up there already. It was the first one, but Matthew chapter 24. Um, these are the words of Jesus Christ as he explains about the second coming and how we wait until that day. Um, and so here's the other line that I don't want you to forget. The second one, and it's already right at the beginning. So if we run out of time and you have to go, at least you got the two lines you have to remember, right? Here's the second one. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to remember that God loves you and he wants to be with you forever he wants you in fact turn to someone right through your mask look at someone and say he wants you go ahead and do it what a great thing to remind each other when you're in the car on the way home in a little bit maybe 30 40 minutes <laughs> we'll see <laughs> um, maybe when you're at the dinner table and you pray before you take up your meal and you look at each other and you say he wants you as you traverse this week and, and you cross paths with some people, I mean, I know some of your stories, how you even have long rides in cars because you do sales or something at another place, and sometimes you ride with another employee, and you get a turn, you get to say, did you know that God wants you? He wants you with him forever. He wants you so much that he gave his one and only son. He wants you. We need to remind each other of that, or we'll begin to fade while we wait. We're, we, we wouldn't be the first ones either. So if you hear nothing else, remember he loves you and he wants you with him forever. That's what this whole thing is about. That God loves you so much, he wants you to know that he is coming back and he wants you to know how to live while you wait. That's what this story is about. That's this teaching that Jesus gave his disciples. He wants you to be ready on the day he returns. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 24. And uh, as Palm Sunday uh, arrives next week, so we're moving into Holy Week. On Palm Sunday, we'll be right here in this space on Maundy Thursday. Uh, we're going to be out on the East Lawn over here. There will be a couple of campfires set up for the 7 o'clock service. We're going to do Stations of the Cross. If there's inclement weather, we're going to move everything inside except the campfires, okay? <laughs> so join us over there on 241, 7 p.m. on Thursday. Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday, we're going to be right here in this building at 10. And before that, there's going to be a great big tent set up on the East Lawn. Uh, join us for a light breakfast. We're just going to hang out together outside before we join our voices together in worship. That sound good? I want you to be a part of that. 
So uh, Palm Sunday is actually in, um, where is it in my, in my notes here? I actually have the chapter of where that's supposed to be. There it is, in Matthew chapter 21. And today we're in Matthew chapter 24, right? Which is just before the Passover that Jesus is teaching his disciples. So in the matter of this whole week after Jesus had entered Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey, he talked about the end times, about the signs of the end of the age where people would try to deceive us. People would say, look, he's there and he's the other place. And Jesus says, no, don't listen to them. Don't follow them. There is a sign and you will know it when I come back. Because the voice of the archangel and the trumpet blast of God will sound and you will see him. That will be the sign. All the other signs of the end of the age are to remind us, to get us into the rhythm, to every day be ready. He talks about the abomination of desolation and how we should flee, but don't take any of our stuff with us because none of this matters. These green chairs not be going into glory with us. They're going to be way more comfortable in your mansion. I promise you. Jesus talked about the return of the Son of Man uh, in Matthew chapter 24, where people will say, there he is. Even the lesson of the fig tree leads us into our text today that we need to be ready at any hour because we don't know when he's coming back. In chapter 24, Jesus was teaching on the Mount of Olives. He had left the temple. His disciples followed him and surrounded him, and he sat down to teach him just before his death. And when you know that that is imminent, you start to say all the important things, all the instructions of what to do and how to live after I leave. That's what Jesus was doing. He's desperate for them to know him and about his return. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Let's jump into our text. Matthew 24, verse 36. They should be right here on the screen. Jesus said this, but about that day or hour, speaking about when he would return, about that day or hour, no one knows not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The day and the hour. So many people want to know that, don't they? I mean, there's books written about it. I turn on the television sometimes. There's pastors talking about it. The day and the hour, especially this past year. Signs of the times. Oh, man, it's just, it's just raging. There's probably a bunch of new books out. I don't know. I haven't bought any of them. Uh, but it feels like the end of times a little bit, doesn't it? Wars and rumors of wars and weather and disease and frustration and, oh my goodness. Here's the bottom line in all those stories. And I've been on the face of this earth uh, about almost 60 years, 59 years. And um, every year people talk about that, every year. I mean, I grew up uh, in the 60s and 70s and Larry Norman was on the scene and one of his songs was, I wish they'd all been ready. Remember that? I'm the only one. Southern California. All right. Every decade, every year, people want to know the date of the end times. They want to know the day, so they look for the signs to know that date, but that's not what the signs are for. The signs are for the rhythm of being prepared. Jesus is very clear that there's more to keeping watch than just trying to figure out the date. Here's job one. Here's the priority. Be ready. No matter when the Lord Jesus comes back, we need to be ready. The scripture says Jesus' very words because no one knows except the Father. So I guess guessing the date or publishing the date, those are out of order. The signs are good to watch, but they don't reveal the day and the hour. They just remind us to be ready. And there is a sign that you won't miss. We talked about that already. The cry of the angel and the trumpet blast. You won't miss that one. Scripture says when that happens, everyone will see him and will be brought into his presence. So Jesus says, so here's, here's what's going on in the heart of the human. Here's why waiting is so hard and why we want to know that day so badly. Verse 37, here's how Jesus, Jesus diagnoses the heart of the human. As it was in the day of Noah, so he brings them into a familiar story. They all knew it. They had that memorized. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So thousands and thousands of years of separation. We don't know how many years of separation that'll be. People will be the same. Times change. The heart of the human, not so much. Verse 38, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Up to the day Noah went into the ark with his believing family, they were filling their guts. They were insatiable for doing life. It's shorthand for saying they didn't know how to do spiritual math. They were short-sighted. 
He's like, well, what do we do today? Here's a bunch of food. Let's eat that. This is shorthand for eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It's a pretty fatalistic view of life at best. In Genesis 6, if you go there and read it, one of the things it says is they didn't even pay attention to faith and belief anymore. They just married whoever they thought was good looking. They would just marry the, uh, whoever it was on the face of the earth, regardless of faith and belief. So Jesus is talking about something way different than just doing life, the condition of our heart. Verse 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. They knew nothing. I think it's interesting, the word that Jesus chose for the word no, because there's two words for no. There's gnosko and oida. Oida is where you know some facts. You heard about it. You read it in the news. You know that there's a person and his name is Jesus. Gnosko is relational knowledge, firsthand knowledge. Like you guys know each other, husband and wife, because you spent years together, right? Dating and then being engaged and then being married. That's relational knowledge. You probably already know some of the things that she thinks before she says them out loud, right? If not, Man, you start learning that. It's going to be really handy, all right? First-hand knowledge from being in a relationship with someone. That's what Jesus was saying. They didn't have a relationship with God, so they didn't get it. They didn't realize that perspective because they missed the signs. I mean, they saw the signs, but they didn't understand them. Jesus says, until they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. This is how it will be. The word here is parousia. It literally is when the owner comes home to deal with the situations. That's what that word means. When Jesus returns to deal with his creation, the second coming of Christ, some people won't have be ready. In the days of Noah, they didn't know until it swept them away, Jesus said, um, even though there were signs. Noah built a boat, a huge boat, and it took him a long time. It's a pretty good sign. Animals came to him from all over the world in pairs, multiples of these animals. They came to him and went up into the ark. I think that's a pretty good sign. It's like, you know, how Frederick Meyer doesn't even get that benefit, right? I mean, how, wouldn't you say, hey, Noah, what's up? Something's wrong here. The most interesting thing to me is if you read it in the book of Genesis, um, on the day that Noah went up into the ark with his believing family and all the animals, it was seven days before God shut the door and sent the waters. It's amazing to me, all these signs, and they could see them, they could read them, but they didn't understand because they didn't have a heart that was in a relationship with God. And then the final day came, swoosh, swept away. The signs of the times were abundant, but their hearts were not ready. Signs help us remember and focus and direct our thinking to remember that he's coming and we should get our heart and life ready. That's what the signs are for. So what does this mean, their hearts weren't ready? Jesus was really teaching this, that there are only two conditions for the human heart. Those without faith and do whatever they want, they just eat and drink all day, do whatever they want with their life, and those who have faith and put God as their priority. Listen to Genesis 6, verse 5. It's here on the screen. Then the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The word wickedness is malignant in Scripture. To be malign, to something's off, something's not right. Um, it means it's not pleasant to look at. The heart of the human without faith has the ugliness of sin overwhelming it. And we know that sin is not pleasant. Listen to Genesis 6, verse 8. But Noah, this is the other kind of heart, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It means elegance or to be adorned. It means that he was pleasing for God to look at because his heart was holy and beautiful because he had faith. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family, verse 9. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among all the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. To be righteous means to follow God's way, his will his law, despite everything else. To be blameless means to be upright and unblemished. He had integrity to the core. It wasn't just for show. And he walked faithfully. What a great commentary about Noah's heart. That when everybody else was doing one thing, that was the, the, uh, the flow of the stream. He was swimming against that flow. 
He listened to God when no one else was. This righteousness in the heart of the human, this righteousness that Jesus is describing is the fruit of faith. It's from trusting in and believing in God, living his will and his way regardless of the culture. Listen, the beauty that God sees is the transformational power of his Holy Spirit that lives in the heart of every believer, that changes who we are so that we, that we live for God, that we love God, uh, first person, that we're in a relationship with him, and then out of that faith comes a life of holiness. It's all about faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, I'll put it on the screen here too. Hebrews 11, verse 7, you'll see it behind me here. Here's the commentary in the New Testament about Noah's heart from the Old Testament. All right, it, it says this about how faith was the source of his righteousness and holiness. By faith, Noah, when warned of the things he had not seen, when given signs about stuff he didn't understand, some people say it hadn't rained from the heavens before this, or to understand that the, the earth held all that water and God released it and all the streams and the water underground was brought to the top, that all the animals would move to him and that there was this, this command and plan to build the ark, all of those things. Noah believed it even though he'd never seen anything like it in his whole life. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. Even though he didn't know and understand everything that God was up to, he followed God's will anyway. That's faith. How we live in this world is directly connected to faith. How, what we believe in, where we set our trust, that directs our behavior. And when he was warned about things not seen, in holy fear... He believed and behaved. He built the ark. I find it interesting that holy fear is in the commentary of Romans 11, or Hebrews 11. Holy fear is a biblical concept. It's different from the fear that we talk about these days. We've been told to not fear uh, COVID or the disease or to have faith, not fear, or if you wear a mask, you must be afraid and don't have faith. I think this is an opportunity to correct our theology a little bit. The Bible talks about holy fear. The fear the Bible talks about is the fear of punishment and revering God. That's what it means to fear God, to revere him and put him first. The fear that drives out, I'm sorry, the love that drives out fear means that we're not going to be punished for our sins. Do you believe that? Jesus was punished for our sins. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the fear of punishment is removed by love. And in its place comes the fear of the Lord, which is reverence. To take him at his word, even when we don't understand everything. To do life his way, even when everyone else is swimming the other way. It's what reverence is. Christians do have fear. It's called holy fear. We put God first and we serve him first. We seek his kingdom and his righteousness because in Christ we're already free from all that other stuff. So we have capacity to do his will. Jesus said, the scripture says, Noah feared God and by faith he was saved. I think it's a sign. It's a sign for us to follow. Holy fear keeps us in the pursuit of God and produces a readiness in our heart, ready to serve him even when others mock him, not living for the day, but being ready for the day of the Lord. At verse 40 in the scripture, let's jump back in. Matthew 24, our text for today. At verse 40, there's only two kinds of people. And from the outside, they look pretty familiar or similar. They're both going to work. They're both engaged in life. They're both sweating while they do their work. But there's only one heart that's ready. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 24, 40. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the hand mill. One will be taken and another one left. And... It, it's surprising, isn't it? I mean, they're both in the same place doing the same job, but their hearts are different. The bottom line is, above all other priorities, be ready every day, every minute, because we don't know when. And that was Jesus' whole point. Our last verse from chapter 24, Matthew 24, verse 42. Jesus said, therefore, keep watch, because you don't know on what day your Lord will return being watchful. That's the discipline that we engage while we wait. To always be ready, to guard our heart above all else. 
It counters uncertainty. I mean, we don't know, so rather than freaking out or waiting to get our life straight until that day, we don't know when it's going to happen. We just live always ready. Being watchful creates an anticipation and keeps us moving forward. Jesus said uh, in the Revelation uh, chapter 3, verse 11, that I'm coming back soon, so we're ready. It keeps us centered on the kingdom, Matthew 6, Jesus' words, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And it gives us confidence, Romans 10, Romans 10, that if we confess with our mouth that he's Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, therefore we'll be saved. It gives us confidence because Jesus said, by its fruit you'll know the tree, Matthew 7. The character and life of the one who is watchful is the one who is alert and self-controlled. Here's how Paul said it in Thessalonians 5. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day will surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We don't belong to the night or the darkness, so let's not be like everyone else. Of those who are asleep, let us be alert and self-controlled. Your version might say awake and sober. Same words. To be alert means to stay awake through the night. To pay attention so that spiritual sloth doesn't undo us. To not let our guard down because it's easy to be spiritually lazy, to forget about our relationship with Jesus and not nurture it. You see, it happens slowly. Uh, the snow melted from my yard like it did yours a couple of weeks ago, and there was a broken pine branch in the bottom of that snow from one of the trees in my front yard, but it looked just as fresh as it did the day it came off the tree. It takes a long time for the branch that's cut to show the signs of being removed from the vine, to have the lifeblood taken from it. It's easy for us to just not nurture that relationship, and pretty soon we find ourselves a long way away. To be self-controlled is pretty simple. It means to be calm and cautious, to be sober, literally, to be aware that the devil is trying to sneak in and, and uh, control your mind and give you thoughts that just take you away. Uh, another meaning of it is... Um, uh, to be irrational or not level-headed. It means that we're just confused and out of our minds, just living for the moment instead of being focused and in the game. This is where we're called to swim against our culture. Our culture today is full of high-stress people with no margins and short-sighted, and their gut is their God, and they, they live by their feelings like in the days of Noah, Jesus said. We're called to be different because our citizenship isn't here. This isn't the kingdom that we'll live in forever. We're just sojourners. This is all temporary. He calls us to be ready for the day of the Lord. Let's finish the text. Jesus said this in verse 43. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and not let the thief break into his house. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour in a day that you don't expect him. He's coming back, right? And we have to be ready because we don't know when. It means standing by. It means being at the ready to answer the call, to be prepared, to have our spiritual house in order. It's the prayer that we have for our kids. So we have four grandchildren, one on the way, and every morning we pray for the parents and particularly the moms. And this is the prayer that we have for the moms, that the Lord would bless them with creative capacity to raise and disciple, disciple those young men to grow up in a crazy world so that they'll know him, love him, and serve him every day of their life with all their strength. Every day we pray that for our daughter and daughter-in-law. May it be your blessing too. That Coven would always, always be ready. And that he would see the signs to remember to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And if it's true for your house and your spiritual house, it's true for all of us. Are you ready? Do you know Jesus like that? Is there anything keeping you from surrendering to Jesus today, from knowing him personally? Then I invite you to empty that thing from your life. Let it become nothing to you. Get rid of it. Anything that keeps you from running to Jesus isn't worth it. Anything that keeps you from swimming against the tide isn't a good thing. The world says you can have it all. Scripture says, word of Paul, to count it all garbage for the sake of knowing Christ. The power of his resurrection and participating in his suffering. So as we finish and move into the last part of Lent in this series called Becoming Nothing, we're reminded that becoming nothing is really hard. 
and it will take the rest of your life to live out your faith, believing that he's coming back, believing that we should be ready. Are you? Let's pray. Father, whatever was to our benefit, we now consider loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Everything a loss because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus as our Lord. We consider it all garbage that we would gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of our own, not from the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. We want to know you, Jesus, to know the power of your resurrection, to participate in your suffering, to become like you in your death attaining to the resurrection. So we press on to take hold of that, for which, Christ Jesus, you took hold of us. Forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, we press on toward the goal to win the prize for which you've called us heavenward. On that glorious day, Jesus, we will see you, our resurrection and our life, for you are the open, the do open door. So come, Lord Jesus, come. Our hope, our glory, and we confess that this earth holds nothing we desire besides you. So break us and mold us and fill us and use us for your glory, for your kingdom, every second until the return of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.